Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. We don't need no badges. I don't have to show you any stinking badges. I tell you right out, I'm a man who likes talking to a man who likes to talk. You're gonna have to answer to the Coca-Cola company. Hey, Luke. May the force be with you. You are a toy! Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Stuff That Dreams Are Made Of. I'm Steven Sparky Parker. And I'm Jessica Parker. And it's been about a month and a half, and we've been very busy. We prepared for the Oscars. Um, we took a trip to Canada and caught some movies on a plane, and and then we got COVID, and we got sick, and we can watch some other movies while we're sick. So we got a lot to talk about. Uh, today so we're gonna hop into that of course we're gonna go over uh, the movies we prepped for the Oscars and uh, we'll catch up with a few of the current years uh, films that we've uh, seen and uh, we're gonna get back in the groove of things with our review of uh, the AFI list and uh, today we're tackling Elia Kazan's uh, On the Waterfront so we got a, a pretty stacked show, don't we, Jess? Pretty stacked indeed. All right. Do you want to bring us into our first movie? Yeah. First, uh, we have down here is Maestro, which we watched to prepare for the Oscars. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the Bradley Cooper's sophomore directorial effort, in which he plays uh, Leonard Bernstein. It's um, and in which Leonard Bernstein is on the toilet talking to people. That was the most phenomenal part of the movie. No, yeah, and they, they, <laughs> they, you know, had big conversations in front of Snoopy balloons, and it's, um... Fine. There are, yeah, it was fine. There are, there are some interesting flourishes mm -hmm. that I think Bradley Cooper brings to it. Like, you know, it starts off in uh, black and white, and then kind of segues into Technicolor. Um, you know, uh, there is a lot of talk about the the nose of it all with his uh makeup but you know i would say the um the old age makeup is actually pretty good uh, interesting when they cover older leonard bernstein sure sure um and th there are a few you know interesting flares like uh, i think there's a scene where they you know kind of jump into a, a musical sequence but uh, ultimately it, it didn't uh wow me on anything honestly i was more impressed with uh tar from last year um as kind of a, a look at the genius and stuff like that and and obviously leonard bernstein was name checked in tar and it wasn't you know specifically about leonard bernstein and leonard bernstein was an impressive talent you know but ultimately that it, it kind of felt like oh what's the the main point of this and the answer was not much mm -hmm. and carrie mulligan carrie mulligan was also very good as his wife but also she's been better in other things like promising young woman so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so yeah i i think yeah i think uh, bradley cooper is a very talented director and i'm still interested to see you know what he does next you know i think it's a a good effort but also ultimately kind of un unnecessary so that's maestro um yeah i feel like it was probably the le i mean it surprises me that it was a best picture nom it it seems like it was kind of the traditional best picture nom you know it's uh 
a tale of a Hollywood uh, legend and stuff like that. You know, it is it's kind of the 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 classic, you know, Hollywood picture type of thing. You know, and it's got some pedigree. Like it's produced by both uh, Scorsese and Spielberg. Um, were producers on this film. Oh, that makes sense then. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, like I said, it's you know the kind of a larger budget that only Netflix can uh, provide for a movie that no one's going to see in a theater. Um, and like I said, there it's got it's got style and stuff like that, but ultimately it doesn't. Like I said, Tar Tar is a more interesting film, you know. It different things, but sure. it it after this it was like, oh yeah, Tar was better. So, and but yeah, like I said, still looking forward to what Bradley Cooper does next because, um, he he does have some flair. I I'm 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 interested to see where he goes from there. So, uh, next up we've got American Fiction. Um, if you want, do want to catch up with these movies, I believe Ma- Maestro is uh, currently streaming on Netflix, and American Fiction is currently streaming on Amazon Prime. And this was an interesting. Uh, I I actually really liked American Fiction. Uh, I did the, as well. Yeah, the trailer um paints it as kind of a broader um comedy than comedy it than it is, which is fair. It is a very funny comedy, and it is very broad. But I think what the the film does interestingly is um, it kind of captures the um, not just the um, oh a, a black guy is rolling into the stereotypes to do this thing, but also captures the you know the banalities of of their lives that cause them to do that. You know, you see uh, him struggling with uh, with money and family and how to take care of an aging parent. Yeah, dating and. And stuff like that. And, you know, often he he doesn't, you know, isn't the most admirable uh, character. But he's trying and he's empathetic. And also, it's really funny. You know, Jeffrey Wright is a great performer. I'm glad that he's finally gotten his Oscar nomination. And, you know, the the rest of the cast in the film are great, too. And there are a, a few, a bunch of really good jokes as well. So there are a lot of heavy hits in this one dramatically mm-hmm. as well. Um. Uh, yeah, it's just a really great movie. It's I feel like it's so well rounded. Um, I'm honestly surprised that it it was one of the best picture nominees, just because it's not. I mean, this is kind of why they expanded it to ten uh, nominees. So you know, and I'm great glad because like they get out. yeah, you know, like interesting pictures that you wouldn't necessarily think. Oh, that's a best picture nominee, but are really really solid uh we'll we'll come around and get get some recognition so yeah um american friction is definitely worth it so oh yeah definitely all right um anatomy of a fall we caught yeah i believe this one is currently streaming on hulu if you have hulu um it's kind of uh hard to describe the uh history of it because it's uh Made by a French filmmaker, Justine Trit. I probably butchered her name. I'm sorry. <laughs> and it's um, about a woman who's a German woman whose French husband is found dead by their son. And the ensuing trial um, that follows to, to prove her innocence. and uh, Or, I guess, disprove her guilt. I don't know. <laughs> The, the the I was a little confused by the French um, justice system justice system at work here, but it was really interesting. I feel like it like really it's it's a good you know drama. It's a good courtroom drama. It gets to the heart of like like how difficult it is to really get an objective truth in mm, situations. Yeah. Like you know, it's got the testimony <clears throat> of the son and you know, the nature of witnesses and how you can be so sure about something, but question yourself once. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a question that's uh, been posed by uh, Shakespeare and a lot of his things. I think I did a, a presentation uh, in one of my Shakespeare classes in college about Mm -hmm. um, how unclear truth uh, can be. Mm -hmm. And, and also, you know, I, I don't know 
if it may be a slight spoiler, but the the film never does quite answer definitively whether the woman killed him or not. Answering which is the, the question point. isn't the point, yeah. Yeah. And but it is one of those that follows in the vein of like uh, Gone Girl, where it's like, you know what? I hope she did. Good for her. I hope. I hope. <laughs> I hope she did. So, not that he was, uh, you know, necessarily the worst person, but you know, every once in a while, a woman deserves to kill a man. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. It's interesting. It's like also kind of a like dances around that question of are we more than our worst instincts about things or like, or not in perspectives. Like it's interesting how it showed their relationship Mm -hmm. and and like um, these were the highs and lows, you know, and like how, you know, I don't know, just, just the way that bitterness can build up. But that does that define the whole relationship? You know, Uh, apparently she co-wrote it with her husband during the pandemic when they were stuck with each other. (laughs) That checks out. That checks out. (laughs) Yep, and uh, American Fiction and Anatomy of a Fall both ended up winning the uh, Oscars for screenplay. So, well deservedly. So, no, well, I mean, I oh. was I was pulling for May December, but <laughs> <laughs> well, can I just uh, say Sterling K. Brown did a great job in American Fiction. I yeah. didn't quite mention that, but they did have these two movies, the three movies. They had good performances. Yep. Yeah. I think Maestro kind of glosses over some of the more interesting questions in Leonard Bernstein's life, if I'm being frank. Like, I feel like it, like having watched DeLovely so lately, mm-hmm. DeLovely versus Maestro, it's interesting what's changed and what hasn't. Yeah. <laughs> in depicting the life of like, you know, somebody who couldn't be themselves. Anyway, just, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting trio of nominees that we caught up with. All right. Um, speaking of nominees, we we caught up with a good chunk of the short film nominees. Um, not not necessarily all of them, but this is going to be the sec- section of the show where we go over um, all the Oscar nominees that for short films that we did see. Mm-hmm. So we'll start with the um, animated. the animated shorts. Yes. So we've got Our Uniform, Letter to a Pig, Pachyderm, 95 Senses, and War is Over, inspired by the music of John and Yoko. Um, of these um, short films, we, we've talked about 95, 95 Senses Senses. before, and I think we, we agree that that was our favorite of the one. Oh, and even our friends who went to go see the Oscar shorts with us, it was yeah. a big... Big yeah, hit, that was sure. that was the the favorite of the 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 bunch there, and it's uh, I, I don't think it's because it's produced by our local film society. Either. Also I think really it's strong. just very solid. Yeah, I think our second favorite must have been our uniform, just yeah. because the artistry was so creative and in like um... yeah, our uniform is about it's kind of an essay about, you know, wearing school uniforms with like hijabs in Iran and stuff like that. And the animators, you know, basically use stop motion animation and, you know, over clothing tailoring to, to do it, which is just a really inventive thing. And then pachyderm and letter, letter to a pig or we're both kind of depressing uh, foreign ones, but I think pachyderm, <laughs> And then Let Her Do a Pig were interesting. And then War is Over was, I guess, fine. <laughs> it's kind of saccharine. It is a little saccharine. Part of me wonders if they gave it to him just because of the name recognition of uh, John and Yoko. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's fine, but it is probably the most saccharine and, you know, placid of the bunch. So. It's, it's least thought-provoking. Like, it was good, like, in a basic way. Of course, like... <laughs> But, I mean, does it say much that's very interesting? All right. Um, We also... Let me... I just realized I forgot to include one on our uh, list here. Uh, We also did catch up with all of the nominees for uh, Documentary Short. I think last time we talked about The Last Repair Shop. But we also caught up with Nine Nine Waipo. And... The ABCs of book banning, 
and the Barber of Little Rock and Island in Between. Um, the winner was uh, the last repair shop, which I actually thought was pretty deserved. It was a really good documentary. But did you have any other thoughts on some of those other ones? Yeah, I think it. Well, I think agree with you. I think it's lovely to showcase such a uh, um, such a neat organization as the group of people that does the repairs. You know, yes. For those school kids' instruments. Um, yeah, no, Nine Nine Waypo was a good slice of life. It wasn't. It was a little slighter than I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. But it still had some interesting reflections on like aging and death and. I, I think it is nice to have a uh, you know kind of slice of life documentaries that aren't just about heavy subjects, but like, Oh, these old ladies who live together, you know, it, it it's fun. <laughs> and then ABC's a book banning. It was okay, but I, you know, I, I you know, it, it, it made a choice not to give any of the arguments that people are making for book banning, but I think some of those are completely insane and it would have benefited from, you know, showcasing those as well. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, ultimately it didn't say that much i mean it's all in the title yeah of, mm-hmm. know, like and then you you also really liked the barber of little rock i did i thought that was like really incredible um social warrior you know that they show showcased the no the, the, the work that goes into creating racial equity yeah yeah pretty incredible what uh what the subject of the movie is doing to help his community you know and then Island in Between is kind of a, a personal uh, reflection on being Taiwanese and um, reflecting on the tensions uh, caused between them and China. And it kind of comes up comes with the the general phrase or uh, uh, vibes of oh yeah, um, we don't want things to escalate between China and Taiwan. We just want everybody to be chill and happy, you know. Mm-hmm. Why can't we be friends? So, and then for the live action shorts, we only actually caught three of those. So we didn't catch up with red, white, and blue or invincible, but maybe we'll catch up with them in the future. But we did see the wonderful world of Henry sugar, which did win. And we talked about talked about that a while ago. And also the after and night of fortune. So, um, the after, I thought was a little disjointed. It's about a father who loses his wife and child to a stabbing accident and becomes a rides share driver. And, and it's sad because this movie is also about toxic masculinity and about how this man is apparently not close to anybody else in his life. And now he's all alone. And it's like, where are all the people that should be checking in on him? This is my question. I, I don't know. I part it's of about the isolation of being a man. <laughs> my, my, my thing with Grief it is, is isolating. Sorry. Yeah, grief, grief can be isolating. He probably, you know, doesn't want to bum people out. Um, part of me feels like it shows too much. Like I, yeah, I think that no, yeah. I, I think it could have done without the entire opening sequence where we see his wife and daughter getting stabbed or something. Agreed, like that. actually. It if it, been. if it had stuck with him, you know, expressing his, you know, just doing his rideshare, you know, job and expressing with his face. Cause David Oyelowo is a very talented actor. He's a great actor. Yeah. And, and the performance is really good. Yeah. The performance is very good. And he has a, like a breakdown at the end, but I felt like the, um, the, the opening scene in which it spells out very clearly what it does was kind of unnecessary, you know, mm-hmm. but anyways, it, it, it's still fine, but actually the, the, the greatest surprise I think was night of fortune. This is, I loved it. I yeah. loved it. I loved it. It's this like Scandinavian film. Mm-hmm. Where is it from? Finland, I believe. Finland. Yeah. And it's about an old man who is <laughs> supposed to be say like paying his final respects to his wife mm-hmm. and, uh, I cannot, uh, bring himself to open the, the casket or face the, the casket. emotion. And then he runs into another gentleman there <laughs> who, in the in the bathroom Who's and like, stuff like that. I need someone to come with me to say goodbye to my wife. Mm-hmm. And uh, then turns out to be somebody. No, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's it's so good. It's a very you know 
touching it 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 doesn't overstay its welcome it's very touching it's very funny it's very european it <laughs> is so good <laughs> it is very uh finnish and yeah it is a, just a, a delight you know uh captures so much about the country and you know does not have a you know an ounce of fat on it you know it's a it's a lean film and it's it's a great so yeah. i feel like it's about men of a certain age too mm-hmm. like yeah. it was so good on many levels it was i think it suffered it 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 sh- that movie showed how much um what was the one we were the talking? after the after kind of suffered, suffered from, from having from, too much yeah exactly on it yeah all right <laughs> well those are the oscar nominated short films um i guess when we saw the animated shorts in the theater it also came with the wild summon and i'm hip which were the the, the weird uh film with the you know the salmon portrayed as scuba divers uh, yeah. <laughs> and then the one the cute one with the cat singing about how he's hip so they're just fun fun but, for all <laughs> all right uh next up we did catch up with origin which was not nominated for any academy awards or anything like that but is the latest film from ava duvernay um i'd heard really good things about it and i do <clears throat> think ava duvernay is an interesting uh, a filmmaker and this is kind of an uh a film about the writing of a news article about how the origin of uh racism in america all comes and comes down to caste the caste system and they you know uh intercut it with uh vignettes from india and germany and uh the deep south as well and I, I do ultimately feel like the film itself is a little bit less than the sum of its parts, which is something mm-hmm. I feel like I, I use a lot there. If, uh, if anything, I feel like the, the vignettes are some of the stronger parts of the film. And I almost wish that this was, you know, done like uh, when they see us in like a mini series that got to flesh out those uh, little bits a bit more. And stuff like that. Uh, did you have any thoughts on origin or? Yeah, I feel like a lot of people speak to the privilege of the speaker. Mm-hmm. Um, because it is somebody who's like, uh, seems like she's from like a wealthier black family, which I mean, it's interesting to have watched this one pretty close to American fiction because I do think they're both centered on like wealthier African American families like american fiction's more about family but this one i mean and, and like how does class insulate you from the experience of you know poorer members of the same group um and so like i know walking out of the theater i heard you know other folks talking about like this person doesn't think racism's real this is outrageous like mm-hmm. which is like i think not an unfair criticism i feel like um but like but also maybe misses the point of like I wouldn't say it's saying that just racism in America is connected to the castes. I see it's just looking at the root of social divides and, and, and like injustice mm-hmm. and how they come back to like people trying to other, other people. And, I will... um, and I do think it's a bit of a simplistic, yeah. View of mm-hmm. maybe of, of America's situation, because I think it kind of, I think it encompasses that, but I think there's also a lot. Uh, yeah. I, I don't necessarily think that her argument is incorrect or flawed i think oh yeah and obviously yeah. It's i feel unfair like to say it's, it's hard to it's maybe incomplete yeah well and i think you know summing it up into a film is, is Makes probably it difficult yeah. Definitely. like i said i wish it kind of expanded on some things i will say the scenes of the uh the lowest cast in india uh, ooh, wow how they make folks clean oh yeah, yeah it makes was... it, it makes the whole slavery thing and the the nazis and it was like oh man but those people it, it they draws, had to clean it draws latrines. the line between they had to like, go diving into latrines <laughs> when it, it it intercuts scenes of the di- of the latrine cleaning where somebody is actually is mm-hmm. literally cast into a bit of filth with the slave ships yeah. which were also pits of filth you know yeah. and like like those through lines between all of those forms of yeah like I said, it's like I, I those are I things kinda, that won't leave you for yeah, sure. No, origin. I think it is good, but I feel like it it needed a little more to to sum it up. Like I kind of wish 
like I said, I wish there was more of it, you know. Well, and I think making and I guess it in we can read the article, of, you know, making it in the context of her life maybe does a disservice to the subject, hmm. in a way. Like it's hard. I feel like that's a hard like hair to split, telling her story versus telling the story of. I don't know. Very possible. Um, another film that wasn't actually nominated for anything because uh, the. Uh, country of france decided to submit this one instead of uh anatomy of a fall for their category to for foreign language or international film um but we saw it it's the taste of things um which stars juliette binoche as a as a cook and then there's the chef that she works with played with by the french guy who she used to date (laughs) i don't remember his name and if Stephen does not remember his name, I certainly do not remember his name, and it is lost to time. I mean, I can probably pull no. it up here pretty quick. It's a it's a good film. It's about like um, Benoit Magimel. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> but yeah, it is it is kind of a nice slice of life film. It's about them making you know elegant uh, food and uh, their day to day things of a chef. It, um. Late eighteen hundreds. It's about a cook and like a um a, a, a fancy chef. Like it, it, there's there is somewhat of a plot to it. You know, it's him and this woman who have worked together for many years are in they're in love, I guess. And you know, eventually tragedy befalls. Um, but I think the main point of this movie is to watch them make uh food you know it does kind of show the process of them creating these uh meals and harvesting the veg vegetables and it is quite luscious um it reminds me of other you know great food films like a particular babbitt's feast is one that i remember watching for a film class that is uh got give give, given real vibes from this one here even like chocolate you know Mm -hmm. this one has a lot of like real sensory like it down to the asmr vibes of like you can hear the food cooking and crackling and cutting and yes no and, and that that's fine there like it, it did not wow me in most instances like i was mostly thinking of other food movies uh during it but i think it is a it's a solid little little film i'm not gonna hold that against it you know mm-hmm. um but as far as a, another international film that was nominated for uh, a film, we've got Japan's Perfect Days uh, from uh, director Vim ben- Benders, actually. <laughs> so uh, what did you think of Perfect Days, Jessica? Um, I thought it was a really sweet movie. It was, um, you know, like a character piece and about like a certain way of life as far as like, you know, living simply and finding joy in that and yeah it the main character reminded me a lot of my my father in some vibes kind of ways mm-hmm. in like positive ways uh that was like wholesome to feel yeah it's a kind of a simple story about a uh koji Okusho playing a gentleman who um, works cleaning the toilets in public toilets in tokyo and um, how he goes through his day with uh, some dignity, you know, eating his lunch, working with co-workers, uh, interacting with a niece that runs away uh, to spend time with him. His hobby of, like, yeah. film. Yeah, his hobby of taking photographs and looking at some and listening to cassette tapes in his car, you know. It had a good soundtrack. Yeah, it's got a great soundtrack, and it's just a very peaceful movie, you know. Um, I did, you do get some of uh, Vim Vendor's uh, vibes from like um, Wings of Desire, so it's always um, interesting to see those uh, motifs carry through, even when he's making a film in Japan. But yeah, Perfect Days is uh, is a lovely little film. Um, we're gonna take a break here from fancy movies, and this is what I'm gonna call the plane section. Um. We were on several flights, so we actually watched a, a few movies. We, we watched individual ones, so we'll kind of talk about them individually. Uh, the first one I watched was from earlier in 2023. There was a 
kind of a slight uh, Ben Affleck uh, starring movie called Hypnotic, uh, written and produced by uh, and directed by Robert Rodriguez, which is kind of an interesting movie. It's about like people who can uh, immediately hypnotize people by talking to them. And it is one of these weird movies where it just continues to have um it continues to spiral forward and forward and forward with different um uh oh here's a twist oh well here's another twist everything is a twist it's all hypnotic and it goes in a circle and doesn't make much sense by the end of it i think it gets lost in the the weeds but it was kind of fun for a plain watch Mm-hmm. Um, if you just have nothing to do for uh, an hour and a half, I think this is a, a solid little, oh, what the heck is this movie trying to do? And yeah, I thought it was a lot of fun. It's got William Fickner as the, the main villain in it, and he's a, a fun screen presence that I've missed for a while. And it's always nice to see him pop up in something with something as meaty as this, so... Indeed. All right. And then I believe I, I've already talked about it before, but you did catch up with uh, Priscilla, right, Jessica? Yeah, on the plane, I was able to catch up with Priscilla. It was a really interesting picture. Um, did it get any nominations? Was it? No, this? it didn't get any nominations this year. And that but... really surprises me because mm-hmm. I feel like it was a really interesting. And it, it is a very different uh, vibe from the Elvis movie that we just got, mm-hmm. you know, while uh, Elvis was just, you know, very Baz Luhrmann y, um, excessive. This one was just kind of a quieter Sofia Coppola. Um, <clears throat> well, and I think it gives a perspective that you don't see a lot in pictures like this because mm-hmm. it's like, um, you know, the story from the point of view of folks that people don't necessarily like. I don't know. It is the, it, this movie is a film version of like, the argument people make of like, sure, it was really great to be a housewife in the fifties. You didn't have any, you know, you didn't have any of these responses. Like, no, it was a gilded cage. Mm -hmm. Like this woman was like Elvis's property. (laughs) Like it is a wild story. And I don't mean to be so harsh Mm -hmm. because I'm not saying like this problem isn't an Elvis problem. This was a social issue of like, no, this is how people treated women. And she was like more of an accessory, like, than a person yeah and like i said i i don't think the film villainizes elvis no but it definitely any... it definitely challenges perceptions of like yeah of like oh he's just like yeah no i mean it, it definitely no yeah yeah i don't think it, it it walks that fine line and it has a lovely soundtrack because of course they had their uh, restriction of not being able to use Elvis songs. So <laughs> <laughs> it was a good soundtrack. I really did like it. No, oh, yeah. So so yeah. I think we both recommend Priscilla, which I believe is now streaming on Max. If you want to see that, Definitely. I think Hypnotic is streaming on Peacock. If you have that. Um. Also on the flight, I caught up with Five Nights at Freddy's, which was uh not not that great. Um didn't quite follow where it was going and maybe it's because it's based on the game but it was i want part of me wonders if it was kind of hampered by its uh pg-13 rating because you didn't really get enough of these animatronic people killing people so <laughs> that's all i'll say about five nights at freddy's it was a little bit of a letdown but then we got home and we were safe and sound and we had covid so we had to catch up with other oscar movies so first up what do we have jessica the color purple and jessica correct me if i'm wrong but you actually have not seen the original color purple correct the spielberg movie i watched it for my spielberg podcast a while ago and it is a pretty faithful reinterpretation of that i was hoping i don't know i was hoping the song and the music would be um more interesting yeah, like sometimes the point of a musical is that it sings what can't be said, right? Yes. And this didn't do much of that. Yeah, it mostly, you know, like there's a push a button song, which is kind of fun, but also doesn't really um, say much. It was like... I think the choreography and the costuming was the great. The choreography, yeah, the choreography was great. And I think the performances are good, too. I think Fantasia Barino is 
is really good in her role. And oh, yeah. obviously Danielle uh, Brooks and Coleman Domingo and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Taraji P. Henson um, are both, um, are all a lot of fun. Um but yeah, I think I think we definitely it, got some lesbian hijinks, which was nice. Which, which <laughs> I, I will let you know is also in the original. So oh, it is. Yeah, I was so. for sure that because you're like, this is not your mother's color purple. I was like, it's because they made it gay. I mean, uh, I mean, it's <laughs> gayer. It's maybe you know, <laughs> it it I I'd, I'd say it's subtle, but it is also not subtle at all in the <laughs> original. <laughs> so, no, yeah, that's hey, good for her. That that, that, that that's part of it. So, um, like I said, it, it's it's fairly faithful, but ultimately, it was like oh, oh also cool. the performance of the daughter-in-law, <laughs> um, the one with the really sad, the tragic story where she gets arrested. Oh, Danielle Brooks, yeah. Okay, Danielle Brooks. I, qu- no, I couldn't yeah. remember the actress's name. She did so good. That was yes, definitely a high she, point. <laughs> she and she was Oscar nominated for that one too, just like Oprah was. So. Heck yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, no color purple. It, it, it was fine, but ultimately. You know, um, I wish the as great, uh, you know, choreography, but I wish, you know, the music, the music was a little more impactful. And uh, we'll we'll talk about other musicals here in a little bit. Um, We also caught up with the documentary, The Eternal Memory, which I guess is from the same director of The Mole Agent from a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's basically the love story between. A couple who's been together for 25 years and he's uh, suffering from Alzheimer's. So kind of, you know, shows their... The wife caring for her aging husband. Yes. The way their love story kind of continues. Yeah, how it continues. And it also flashes back to their things. Like he was an important news anchor during a time where the, you know, the government in Argentina was, you know, running havoc. You know, we, we talked about El Conde last time that these were the other side of El Conde. In fact, the director of El Conde was a producer on this film. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it was really good. Definitely. Mm-hmm. I feel like such a human story and such a, because part of it takes place during the pandemic, you know, definitely like a lockdown story. No, yeah. Um, really charming documentary. I guess the one that did end up winning was when we caught up with a long time ago. Um uh, 20 Days in Mariupol, which we caught on oh, Sundays yeah. last year. So, Which was, I mean, I could definitely see mm-hmm. why that one, that one was like an amazing piece of, of reporting and documentary. Mm-hmm. Then we also caught up with some of the best song nominees. So we caught up with Flamin' Hot on Hulu, um, which is, you know, your, your typical uh, brand recognition capitalist uh, thing although it was nice that they did uh, blame the 80s recession on ronald reagan because they're not wrong so. bold move frito lay bold move <laughs> <laughs> you know it had a lot of um character i feel like it was um i know a lot of people who the story resonated with a lot who really enjoyed that yeah it's uh, a fun a fun immigrant um style story and uh it does have a little spunk i think um ava longoria had fun directing this film Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's it's fun to see uh some of the characters that pop up like uh dennis haysbert and uh tony shalhoub and Mm -hmm. matt walsh not the right wing one so uh we also caught up with american symphony the documentary on netflix which was also really sad about um Oh, and I, I don't know if sad is really the word, but it's about John Batiste and um, all his struggles. And it is a very, um, it does kind of capture the same kind of vibe that Maestro does, you know, dealing with a, a spouse that's suffering from cancer while also having to, you know, conduct it at the Philharmonic and um, also be the band leader for, uh, you know Stephen Colbert and winning Grammys and Oscars and stuff like that. <laughs> it was a really electric kind of story. I thought it was, um, yeah, no, I thought I thought it was very impactful. What was the name of the musician or the John Batiste? John Batiste, you said it already. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. my brain was trying to remember what film this was. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. No, he has an incredible story, and definitely excited to see what um 
what the future brings with him. Mm-hmm. I think it was a neat spotlight and definitely, you know, yeah. I don't know. D- definitely... I, I still like Tar better. So <laughs> <laughs> I will count on you saying that for our, our long marriage. <laughs> still not as good as Tar. All right. Um, and then uh, one that I caught up with without Jessica because I had the day off and I picked a one that I knew Jessica probably wouldn't care to watch. Um, Society of the Snow on Netflix about the, uh, the Chilean rugby team that got stranded and had to eat their dead friends. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a nice inspirational movie, but I'm also the kind of person who, uh, you know what, guys, just just eat me. Just eat me. I don't need to live through something like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, be eaten. Uh, be eaten. Thank you. Yeah. Why be? Why stick around when you can be a tasty snack for someone else <laughs> and give them the thing? And like it is. It is. It's inspirational. It's well made. But yeah, I'd I'd never want to survive. It was the same thoughts I had during um, Nyad. It was like, oh, you're gonna swim to Florida from Cuba. Why? I. <laughs> it it's it's one of those things where i was like oh why would i want to survive something like this so but you know it is it, it's still an inspiring thing and it, heartwarming as well but also uh i don't relate to it <laughs> all right well our last uh film to, to catch up for 2023 um because it was oscar nominated but it isn't officially coming out in theaters until like may but we got to catch a sneak screening, and that is Robot Dreams, the nominee for Best Animated Film. Um, it's from a Spanish director, and um, it's mostly a wordless uh, odyssey of a dog and a robot who are friends. And um, It's essentially a silent film. Yeah. It was really cool. I mean, it it's not necessarily silent. It has some great uh, music and sound uh, needle drops. That kind of represent the thing that does the talking for them. Uh, there's a scene with a bunch of singing flowers and uh, some singing birds doing Danny Boy, and it's it's a lovely little film, and it is it's kind of a testament to the you know people talk about it's like oh animation isn't just for kids it's it's not a genre it's it's a medium, and it is a lovely uh, little film that I'm glad exists. So I can't wait for um the rest of you guys to see this one here mm-hmm. now as far as more recent films we've got a few of those to talk about as well i did mention musicals which is mean girls which we caught up with our friend who loves musicals on her birthday yes and uh, spoiler alert i've never seen the original mean girls <laughs> so i had nothing to to really compare this to i mean it was it was mostly fine I've seen um, them both. They're not really my genre, but I did, and there are things I uh, didn't enjoy that much, but at the same time, I could appreciate a lot of it. Yeah. I, I will say the songs themselves aren't that interesting to me either. Yeah, yeah. I like, thought the performances were more interesting than the songs. Yeah. And I also, I'll shout out um, uh, Connor Ratliff from the I'm George Lucas documentary appears as one of the teachers in Mean Girls. So mm-hmm. um, shout out to him. It's fun to see how the the um, the portrayal of women has changed in the last couple decades to go from Mean Girls to the the movie to, to the musical to see like the the different choices from that stage they to screen to screen. to screen to stage to screen again. Yeah, interesting. Um, like I said, it's not really my genre, and ultimately, I didn't feel the songs were necessarily um, that intriguing. But I still, the, the performances are fine. You know, we also caught up with Drive Away Dolls. Um, what did you think of Drive Away Dolls, Jessica? This movie was horny as foretold. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah this was a fun one it was just like a good like buddy slash romantic comedy <laughs> yeah it's kind of um you know uh ethan cohen's made um a film you know he made his uh shakespeare um uh, macbeth movie 
And now his brother Ethan and got together with his wife, and they made uh, driveway dolls. And I think from this we can surmise that maybe Ethan was the goofy Cohen. Because <laughs> <laughs> this this really does. Um, it's really playful. Yeah, it does get back to the kind of vibes you get from Raising Arizona or um, The Big Lebowski. And, um, <laughs> I just think romance is not relevant to the modern. It's modern, definitely got like my 20th seed, century. a barren place where my seed could find no purchase. Yeah, and you got Margaret uh, Qualley and Geraldine this. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Geraldine is from... Uh, from miracle uh, workers, yeah right? miracle she workers she was great in this yeah i'm going to pull up her name and attempt to say it because she deserves it mm-hmm. although she doesn't deserve the butchering i'm going to get to it but geraldine this one so yeah they're, they're fun there's also um you know uh some fun character performances by like coleman domingo and um bill camp as a uh, the surly uh rental uh worker and Wait, then, who is what's her who is Andy McDowell's daughter? Uh, Margaret Qualley. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. some great little intergenerational crushes going on between those two ladies from yeah. from us and our friends. And uh, Matt 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 Damon also has a a, a fun uh character role. Yes, this is a, a goofy movie, and um I guess we'll we'll also in a bit talk about another um kind of similar vibe but like opposite direction for like more of a film noir uh lesbian (laughs) film so uh we also caught up with argyle which was what's the word i'm looking for it's interesting it's a lot of faint yeah kind of a lot it's it's interesting the bits that it goes all out for and the bits that it doesn't seem to be trying at all for yeah, no, it's... And, and then, like, it kind of reveals itself to be, like, maybe this is because it's a takedown of genre rather than a crappy movie, but... Yeah, I mean, it's it's got, like, a stacked cast, you know? You've got uh, Sam Rockwell, Bryce Dallas Howard, John Cena, Henry Cavill, Samuel Jackson, Brian Cranston, um, Dua Lipa, um, you know... Catherine... Catherine O'Hara... Uh... Um, and yeah, you know, everyone is, is likable and fun and it's impossible not to have a good time with these characters. I mean, like I said, it does go a ways, um, and it it is goofy and, you know, in that kind of, uh, Matthew Vaughn style Kingsman way, but also not quite because it is PG-13, so... (laughs) (laughs) But also, ultimately, gonna, I think it is, it's a fun enough watch, you know? I'm going to shout out small fat icon Bryce Dallas Howard because she's sick of talking about her body, but I'm not sick of seeing portrayals of uh, women who aren't being harassed for their body size in a film and also of a female protagonist that gets to be a little larger than her male counterpart in, mm-hmm. in her physicality and not be taken away from in any way, either of them. And, you know, I... You know, maybe a slight film, but I still appreciated that. No, 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 that's all, that's always nice. And, you know, it's not the kind of thing that's, like, patting itself on the back because, yeah, oh, no, we cast true. a slightly is. fat, you know. We, we cast a somebody who's larger. Hollywood fat. Like, yes, no. It doesn't, you know, draw attention to it. It just lets a Bryce Dallas, Dallas Howard be Bryce Dallas Howard. And she's, she's great. You know, I'm glad that she got um, a role like this that lets her kind of uh, play, you know, in that thing and you know I'm, I'm 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 almost a little sorry that we're bringing it up because i feel like it defeats the purpose if we bring it up but um, you, know. you might feel that way but uh, and i feel i understand that she doesn't want to talk about it to the press because they suck but yeah. i think she deserves to know that people appreciate it yes no that's so, that's what i that's what i hope we're, we're doing instead of, yes like we appreciate the fact that it hasn't been hammered uh down our throats like disney you know sticking half a second of someone getting something so and being like look how great we are we're great um another movie which i'm actually not sure when you guys are going to get to see because it's still um looking to get into some film festivals and i only got to see it because i helped donate to its kickstarter but it is a documentary about um life at byu and it's called a long way from heaven and it kind of uh 
covers the the fairly recent uh, not not just the recent experience but i guess it goes back further of the history of lgbtq yeah. students at the university at, at and B- some of brigham young recent... university and some of the more recent uh developments and it's been something that i've i've followed closely since a while you know when i was at byu you know i had at least three roommates who you know later came out as gay and um who knows there there could have been more and i'm certain that there are people there and they you know deserve to be taken care of and i think it's um a necessary documentary um i think it's a well made uh obviously they still may be tooling with it there um I th- as the director said and it's like it was talking to a lot of sad gay people but i think it also kind of captures um a level of hope and and there is there is some fun in it. My one of my older roommates is Stacy Harkey, who's in uh, um, Studio C. Yeah, Studio C and uh, JK Studios, and he's a he's a fun uh, he's a fun presence and does lighten up some of the the sadness there. But also, yeah, I think it it's sad, but stories also there's a little bit of hope you know uh, which is which is you know i'm glad and we hope for and pray for so long way from heaven i hope you guys get to see this soon but uh we'll keep you posted when it does finally come out so that you guys can see it and then uh last night we actually just caught up with love lies bleeding which um i had very low expectations going into it um because it's just you know it appears to just be a movie about you know lesbian bodybuilders with uh, some film noir stuff which is fine but i was actually kind of wowed by this movie mm-hmm. i found the the filmmaking style of rose glass very uh revelatory um it kind of reminded me of I, I follow this um, this screenwriter who talks about how people have great ideas and stuff like that. And it says an idea isn't anything. It's about how you execute and write it, you know. And he gave examples of, you know, basic stories that are very well executed. And that's what I, I think of this. There is I, I almost feel like this uh, entire film was uh, uh, predicated around the one of the images we see near the climax I won't spoil it for for you, but I'm I'm hoping they conveying the the I guess the surprising image that um, is kind of referenced through the movie, but then erupts into full bloom at the end. Um, and I think it was just uh, sculpted around that. I love the as soon as I heard the score and saw that it was by Clint Mansell, I knew I was in for a bop because he's one of my favorite composers. Mm -hmm. Uh, doing stuff from like, um, uh, oh, Moon and, um, oh shoot, what's that drug addiction movie? I keep forgetting the name of it. Um, but yeah, I know, uh, it's not like a perfect film, like most film noirs kind of have like a messy kind of uh requiem for a dream is the movie i was trying to think of have like a messy um moral compass and presentation there but i kind of just loved how messy that this film was and i also wanted to say that i also want to give jessica her time because i know she did not have the same response as me to it so no i just knew from the advertising that i was gonna feel a certain kind of way about it because um um, it was one of those movies that has a strong aesthetic and that people really enjoy. And like, while a lot of movies like this are really subversive and they're telling queer stories for the first time, I personally just feel like they're still leaving out a lot of members of queer communities by like having a certain kind of aesthetic where, you know, like basically let dykes be fat. And I, I love that Kristen Stewart gets to play grungy, but you know, she's still ultimately like Hollywood beautiful. And, and so like, I really love movies that love, like women love women, but I would just like to see a more, like a more, 
healthy reflection of that. And I feel like, like something that's really big in queer con and I, I realize I am not the audience and I'm not the person that needs to, you know, heal from all the shit ways that media treats, you know, queer people. But, um, at the same time, like you're not being that subversive if you're still not being inclusive. And, um, that's how I feel like a lot about a lot of queer media, but that might be unfair. And I'm, that's not what this movie's about. And I definitely still agree with what you're saying. And I think it's a pretty amazing film. And I just walked, I just knew I was going to walk away from it feeling a certain kind of, um, let down. And I was hoping that I wouldn't, but I did. <laughs> I'm sorry. And that's okay. Like that's every movie's not for everybody. That's just, I feel like those stories are still kind of waiting to be told, you know, mm -hmm. or do you feel like uh drive away dolls was a better representation of this or a little bit, but ultimately still not. Yeah. Like I still feel like most of the people in these films still fit like a cert fit, like a certain kind of beauty standard, mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, ugh. But that's like all Hollywood films, so it's unfair of me to hold this up to that standard. It's just, I guess when you you hope when a movie is being progressive that it's gonna go all the way, mm -hmm. and sometimes it doesn't. And I just I do think this movie was beautiful. I have a hard time with relationships that are are, are toxic because like it's film noir, so it's gonna be messy. No, and no, yeah, it, and it's glorious. But yes, also I'm like, oh no, the red flags. Oh, no. no, yeah, there there are a bunch of red flags in this. The whole movie's and, a red, like yeah, like that's not the point. We're not supposed to find anything to emulate here but um, it, it is still revelatory like you're still enjoying so no yeah I, I think you know I yeah you you do hope for films and I think it's important for us to find those films and and champion them but I also you know realize that you know a film doesn't have to be everything to everyone oh yeah and, no, and um I know I, I I honestly found as like I was interested in it's like, oh hey, this has got a real buff lady in it, you know. Kinda reminded me a, a bit of the uh, uh the big sister from uh Encanto. You know? <laughs> yeah. I was so like, she Oh, she's so glorious. strong. She was so great. She was Yeah, great. no, yeah. They... And Kristen Stewart obviously is fantastic. But mm -hmm. like but like no, who was the actress that plays uh Um Katie O'Brien? Jackie, right? Katie yeah, O'Brien. No, Jackie, she was yeah. great. She She's was... the the danger late lesbian from uh <laughs> from uh The Mandalorian. So yeah, she's incredible. She she's got a long uh future of playing danger lesbians, so No. Just like as somebody who knows people who come out and then have to deal with body dysmorphia all over again because queer communities can still fall prey to like these stupid beauty standards mm -hmm. like uh, that's why i watch these films and go oh no but like i'm i'm just a simple man who knows i'm ugly and knows that everyone else is beautiful especially <laughs> jessica so mm -hmm. <laughs> so i just i just I, I just appreciate all of the 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 beautiful, big, and strong, and skinny ladies, you know, they're, they're, they're all beautiful. And some of the dudes are beautiful, too. But not me, because I'm a worm, so. <laughs> I love you, Stephen. I love that you love this movie. I, I, also, I also believe that if I had, like, a shred more of any self-confidence, that I would become a total monster. So I'm very proud of how little I think of myself because <laughs> the world could not handle me with any sense of self uh, worth. So <laughs> Boop. <laughs> anyways, um, like I said, we, we caught up with a lot of movies, but we also caught up with our AFI movie. So it's time to jump back to 1955 and talk about Alea Kazan's On the Waterfront. Um, Elia Kazan is kind of a, a controversial character. I remember loving this movie as a kid. Did you ever? Uh... I watched this movie when I was going through my Marlon Brando phase, and mm -hmm. it was definitely like, oh, he's so beautiful. But um, it all went did over you my think head he was, otherwise. Did you think he was beautiful in The Godfather? Or um, I did not watch The Godfather as oh, part okay. of my Marlon Brando <laughs> phase. So, so you were just doing the young, young, swarthy uh brando so <laughs> i watched a lot of brando yes uh yeah this this is a movie i i think i i'll, I'll be frank i still think it's a very well-made movie it's very melodramatic um it's very 
on the nose pastiche um but it is well made at that and i think it is a solid older movie and also i think it's a little problematic i love that uh, orson welles was like you know the the director elia elia kazan is a traitor but he's a great director yes (laughs) so fair so say marlin i guess and i waited until the movie was over to tell jessica about the 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 brief history of elia kazan and how he was a friendly witness at the house un-american activities committee (laughs) (laughs) and uh named some names and then he made this movie about a guy who uh there's another informer can i read it yeah sure orson wells uh was asked a question about kazan in Paris, and he replied, Cherie, mademoiselle, you have chosen the wrong matter, uh, mature and scene, because Ilya Kazan is a traitor. He is a man who sold to McCarthy all his companions at a time when he could continue to work in New York at a high salary. And having sold all his people to McCarthy, he then made a film called On the Waterfront, which celebrates the informer. Mm-hmm. Which is a celebration of the informer. I feel like that says it well. Like, yeah. But I also like how you said it. You were kind of like, "This is an apology from you to me," and I do not accept it. <laughs> yeah, as it kind of reminds me of the little bit of uh, Melissa McCarthy on SNL playing Sean Spicer, and I was like, first off, I'd like to apologize on behalf of you to me, and that apology is not accepted." <laughs> <laughs> Very much the point. Um, it, yes, it it is, and you know, I I believe. Elia Kazan is a more nuanced character oh, than sure. just uh, it sounds like an informer. At least but... one of the people he informed on was also being subpoenaed, and they had agreed to inform on each other as like, "Yes, I'm your safe word." Like, no, you can, yeah, like, I'll, I'll report on you. Like, you can it, report on it was a scary time and and stuff like that. I think he would argue that the people he informed on were already being informed on, which yes. is still does that make it right? <laughs> I mean, you know, like, it sounds like he definitely faced, like, complicated responses about this. And... Mm-hmm. But um, let's get into the the nuts and bolts of the film. Obvious, uh, Marlon Brando's uh, character um, is kind of a, a low-level lackey for the mob. His older brother, Charlie the Gent, played by Rod Steiger, is kind of the, right the muscle. Uh, the mental to muscle. The, me- the mental muscle to the... Uh, Johnny Friendly, played by Lee J. Cobb, who is a corrupt union boss. Yeah, who took over the union, and he because he has it coming. Uh, did you recognize him from uh, Twelve Angry Men? Okay, he I was the I angry juror in that. <laughs> Bless me. And then, um, uh, anyways, he he's basically called to lure uh, some guy who's talking to the the police out into the open where he's then chucked off a roof. And he thought they were just going to lean on the guy. I thought they were just going to talk to him. But anyways, so afterwards he starts a relationship with the guy's brother or guy's sister. Wouldn't that be a, that would be quite the, (laughs) a transgressive film. uh, film. But yeah, he uh, befriends Eva Marie Saint in her first uh, film performance and um, starts a relationship with her and he's initially uh, being asked to spy on some of the folks that are um because there's also a rabble rousing priest trying to to get people to speak up against the union the, corruption. the union corruption and stand up for their union and stuff like that yeah like it's it's pretty crazy not only do they like are they corrupt about the union dues but they only like let guys who take out these extortionary loans work mm-hmm. like it's it's there's like lots of levels to what's going on and somebody needs to speak out. And the priest's like, you have my support. This is my flock. Yes. And uh, one of the guys agrees to speak out and then they uh, find out that he was. And so they drop a they crate him. on him. And then the, the priest gets to give a rousing speech. Oscar worthy. And meanwhile, uh, the, the bum, uh, Marlon Brando is speaking of red flags, you know. <laughs> oh no. The the relationship in this film and the type of machismo that it like I almost feel like Donald Trump is a caricature of Marlon Brando's character in this movie. Like mm-hmm. the persecution complex this man has. 
yeah. is like, like the character is, is like, I know we're supposed to be rooting for him, but it's like, oh no, this is so many toxic things. <laughs> like, yeah, girl run. <laughs> like, like no, say, yeah. I can save him. <laughs> no. Yeah. And you know, um, Ava Marie Saint's character, she she does a good job. She yeah, she does a great job. She's a she's a young waif, but she's like, no, I want to find out who killed my brother. And then eventually, she's like, oh no, I don't want Marlon Brando to get hurt, even though he's uh, breaking into my house to tell me he loves me and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, so bad. This relationship is so. Uh, oof, it's just all the. Yep. Uh. So yeah, um, ultimately, you know, we're, it's interesting because he really is. He's not. He's a difficult hero. You know what I mean? I don't know if he's supposed to be a hero. He's kind of somebody who's gone with the flow, like everybody else. Just wants to keep his head down. Uh, you know, will look away and kind of, and doesn't even actually care that he's keeping his head down. Like yeah, until he meets this girl who's like really upset about you know the deaths he doesn't seem to be bothered by them and then i mean it's you know he's got a sad backstory like him and his brother were orphans and it's the brother who's looked out for him but realizes he's done a disservice to himself by going along with all these yeah i think ultimately he doesn't decide to to tell on him until they kill ice his brother oh, yeah then they so. kill his brother and then he's like because they kill his brother for not killing him so because he's not informing well yeah slash sleeping with the enemy yeah so i mean he's really honestly not like i get you know I, it's it, it, it's powerful melodrama you it know? is it is and like um kazan it said like he wasn't political so much as he was social psychological he's more interested about mm -hmm. the psychology behind why people do the things that are you know so mm -hmm. like i think you can definitely see this in this movie like it it deals with the more grainy personal reasons that people do things like there's a, a little kid who looks up to him, but after he, he rats on the, the mob, the guy kid goes in and kills all his pigeons. <laughs> and he's, you're just like, Oh my gosh. Like, uh... And then like the movie ends with him, you know, going down to the dock, trying to get work and they won't let him in. And then he gets in a fight with the, the mob boss and gets the tar beat out of him. And then all the other people are finally inspired. And it was like, we won't work. We'll unless... stand by. Yeah. We won't yeah. work unless you work. They do some collective actioning, which is fine. Collective but bargaining. yeah, collective bargaining. Yeah. But also it is interesting. It is message. It is. It is a very interesting message that he made this right after the <laughs> UAC <UAC> meeting. <laughs> Celebrating the informants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wrote this apology for, from you to me on behalf of you. I do not accept. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't seem like it really did keep him from working for the rest of his life. Like he seemed to have had a, you know, go on and make the pictures. Yeah, he had he had a pretty um, you know, long career. Obviously, you know, I think he you know, did rattle some feathers from his, you know, things, but I think ultimately it's most that people clear into the 90s when they gave him an honorary Oscar, you know, that people were still upset by it and some mm -hmm. would clap and some were protesting. It's like tells you about the strong feelings. Sid. No, yeah. Like, I mean, it is a part of uh, Hollywood history that they, you know, do have a, a sticking point to. And, you know, um, you know, back back when I saw it, I guess I was technically a young Republican. So maybe that's why I was like, oh, yeah, better than those commies and stuff like that. So who knows? maybe that's why I liked it <laughs> as a well, it's kid. Like you can't be mad at this kid for being like, you ran into the cops. It's like. Yes, we do not like cops. They are mm -hmm. not your friends. <laughs> well, and, and to be honest, you know, he, you know, the, the mob instantly found out when the other guy was subpoenaed, you know, so I'm pretty sure that, that they've they... got inside cops. So it's probably not a good idea to talk to the cops. So, yeah, no, that's, that's very true. That <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the point of the story is folks don't, don't talk to the cops. Do not talk to the cops. Yeah. Uh... But yeah, no, he, like, he has a pretty long filmography, even. That's his biblia. Biblia, man. Mm -hmm. Darn it, Wikipedia filmography. No, yeah, he, he'd go on to 
direct like oh, east, still of, did east of eden east of eden uh a face in the crowd is an interesting one it's got like andy griffith as i've never seen it but i've heard um about it it's got like uh andy griffith as kind of a populist uh folksy presidential candidate mm. which some folks you know view as kind of a reagan kind of trump kind of oh. thing or reagan yeah that's a that's a thing there so yeah, like I said, he, he's he's got a, an interesting um, aesthetic, and I don't think that he's necessarily uh, the worst thing you do is not the worst thing. Doesn't define you your whole life, you sure, know. Sure, sure. So. We did interesting pictures, right? He did. It sounds like an early picture on anti-Semitism in Hollywood, and mm-hmm. just like interracial relationships, and like you know, th- those were pretty bold topics for yeah. his time. So. No, like I said, I, I I appreciate him as a filmmaker. I do think it's interesting the, the timing of this movie here. <laughs> it doesn't it hold up as well once <laughs> you're uh, once you're you know um, aware of all the context and stuff like that. But it, it's it's, like, it's still a very well made movie. Here? So it's it's high melodrama when and it's, it's best. I so. enjoyed watching it because it is it is fun to see how movies change for yeah. you as you get older. And obviously, and the score it, it's by the maestro Lenny Bernstein. So. <laughs> The maestro himself. The maestro himself. Maybe yeah. he wrote it on the toilet. Yeah, maybe he wrote it. Yeah, written on the toilet by Leonard Bernstein. He probably dictated it while he was on the toilet to his friends who were mm. watching him. <laughs> that was the craziest part of that movie. I'm so sorry. I can't imagine a biography being made of you and showing like some of these most intimate things that you're like, I hope, kind of. Open I about. hope my <laughs> biography takes place entirely on the toilet. <laughs> I had to circle back. I'm so sorry. I <laughs> nope. don't think I'll ever get over that. <laughs> I, I think that is an apt place to wrap up today <laughs> is by circling back to the toilet. Um, but yeah, anyways, our next episode, we're back in the swing with the AFI list and we're going to tackle Buster Keaton and the general. Which I own because I am a Buster Keaton girl. <laughs> She's a Buster Keaton girl, guys. So as always. We get to unpack that. As always, I'm Stephen Sparky Parker. And I'm Jessica Parker. And fun fact, this was entirely recorded on the toilet.